We follow Dylan O'Donnell, a YouTuber who has done quite an admirable job in showcasing the resplendent beauty of the universe with his astrophotography. We applaud his work and wish him continued success. Recently, he posted a video entitled 10 Most Useless Astronomy Products, Trigger Warning, stating in the description that, quote, I continue my quest to alienate myself from the entire astronomy community, end quote. And then he extends an ostensible invitation to support his alcoholism by getting some star stuff. Dylan, no one really believes you're an alcoholic, seriously. We're not triggered at all either, Dylan. And welcome this opportunity as a teaching moment and don't believe you really wanted to alienate yourself at all from the entire astronomy community. You certainly didn't alienate us. Welcome friends, Dr. Jim Daly of Astronomy for Change here, your host, bringing you this response to Dylan's original video. Link in the description below. Okay. Dylan O'Donnell here. Over the years on this channel, I've managed to offend a lot of people. And if over the years I have offended you, I just want you to know that that was not my intention. Uh, my intention was to offend everybody. And if you're offended that I haven't offended you, then good, because I will get around to you. And this video is going to be one of those videos. Today, I'll be talking about 10 pieces of astronomy equipment, which I believe are completely useless. Of course, this is going to upset vendors, and so there is no sponsor on this video. But if you want to buy me a beer, just click on my links I earn from affiliate commissions and, you know, buy a shirt or something. Anyway, my name is Dylan O'Donnell, and you're watching Star. Before we begin, the question begs asking, why, Dylan? Why would you want to do this? It needs to be gently pointed out that the adept use of a telescope fitted with a camera, regardless of the technology involved, does not qualify one to be an astronomer. It also needs to be pointed out that a telescope is an observational instrument used by an astronomer, astronomers to observe and or study particular objects of interest, not just to take pretty pictures of them. When outfitted with a camera, the telescope then becomes an astrograph, a term that you don't see used quite often at all. Technically, that's what it is. For example, Clyde Tombaugh of Pluto fame discovered Pluto in 1930 with the 13-inch astrograph at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's a 13-inch refracting telescope with glass plates. Oh my God! at the focus to record the images. Film plates that needed to be chemically developed and processed. This must be ancient history. And subsequently analyzed with painstaking care without the use of digital technology. Oh heavens. To those who were born after 1990, this is an anathema and something they had no way to assimilate or understand. An astrophotographer is not an astronomer and vice versa, an astronomer may or may not be an astrophotographer. Astronomy is a science, and the oldest of the sciences at that end, with the discipline, we have the amateur and the professional. Generally, and in most cases, an astrophotographer is an amateur hobbyist who is adept at using the latest technology, especially when supported with that technology by a large corporation who has a large marketing budget and leverages the reach of the internet and the addiction to eye candy, as it were. There are two particular points in Dylan's video that got our attention. His first point and his last. For the, as for the rest of them, we more or less agree with him, more or less. And his first point. Paper and cardboard planetariums and star charts. Now, I used to use these when I was about seven years old. Every month I get a new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, brilliant magazine. I read it cover to cover. But whenever I get to these sections with star charts, I've got to be honest, I just skip them. I can feel the visual purists rolling their eyes, but honestly, we have computers for this stuff. This stuff was generated by a computer and then printed 
on a dead tree so that we could look at it. I don't look at it. I do enjoy almanacs and I do enjoy having a printed copy of stuff that's going on every year, but I will always defer to the computer, whether it's Stellarium, whether it's the augmented reality sky guide app on my phone or Sky Safari or something like that. We don't need to cut down trees to look at the stars. The use of printed sky charts is a waste because we now have digital platforms. Oh my God, really? What did they do in the time of Galileo, Dylan? What did they do in the time of Copernicus? What did the Greeks do? What did Aristarchus do when he actually figured, oh my God, heavens. What did the ancient Sumerians do? They didn't have the internet, but yet they were able to give us time and the 60 minutes in an hour, the 60 seconds in a minute. Guess where that came from? That came from the ancient Sumerians about 6,000 years ago. As far as learning astronomy and how to navigate the sky, digital platforms are actually a detriment not a benefit. Really, they are. To that point, and quoting from our soon to be published book on the topic, in 1978, more or less, I started using Burnham's Celestial Handbook, an observer's guide to the universe beyond the solar system, the three volume set. Burn Robert Burnham Jr. was born in Chicago, 1931. And moved with his family, basically the year after Clyde Tambor discovered Pluto. And moved with his family to Prescott, Arizona in 1940. Burnham was a shy and introverted person and spent much of his time observing with his self-made telescope. And not any of these other big vendors with, with uh, very well-funded marketing departments who love to spread their, their wealth around. All right, he received considerable notoriety in 1957 when he discovered his first comet with that very same telescope. The notoriety did not go unnoticed, and Burnham was hired in 1958 by Lowell Observatory, Flagstaff, Arizona, as previously mentioned. He was hired to work on a survey of stellar proper motion. That's when we actually have to study the plates and figure out how fast these stars are really moving relative to each other and relative to us. That's called proper motion. Okay. He used a blink comparator, basically the ancestors to what we have today is the modern digital blink comparator. Basically does the same thing. You compare two images side by side and, and look for any changes. Any change will appear as a, 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 um, a change, a blip, or a, a spot that translates back and forth if there's a misalignment, right? They actually had glass plates and they had to process them in a dark room with a long developing process. Typically, one night's plates, you wouldn't get to see them until the next day. Today, we can do it instantaneously with a digital camera. Okay, I guess it, it's, um, so we've improved. The science of astronomy remains the same. The technology has been enhanced a little bit since then. Okay, so Burnham used a blink comparator. He worked on this project for the next 21 years, during which time he and a colleague, Norman Thomas, discovered five more comets and over 1,500 asteroids. How do you suppose they did it? Okay, painstaking work. And when you, you put in painstaking work, you actually learn and come to appreciate the universe in which you live, not just to take pretty pictures of it. There's a huge difference. Okay. I'm taking a little time here to use Burnham as an example, as his story deserves to be remembered as more than just some obscure footnote in the annals of astronomy. He had a pure, unvarnished love for the science, the universe, the stars, and the sky above. Having spent much time with, this, with the three volume set, I personally can attest to the painstaking care, devotion, and dedication the author had in bringing this work to fruition for the benefit of everyone. Hard copy, solid books, three volume set, each one is like this. Very comprehensive. It should be pointed out, well, it took him 12 years to complete the work. In his off hours after he's finished his daily work at the observatory, and dedicated himself to completing this uh, side project of his. It should be pointed out that this work was never sanctioned by the observatory and that he did this on his, of his own volition outside of his formal duties. Writing for the Phoenix New Times in 1997, 
Tony Ortega described Burnham as an author whose, quote, whose name has become so familiar to some readers it has become a sort of shorthand, as it were, like Audubon is to the birders, Hoyle to the card players, or Webster to poor spellers, and lastly but not least, Robert to the parliamentarians. The original project he was hired for, the Observatory Survey of Stellar Proper Motion, was completed in 1979, the year following the publication of his three-volume set. At this point, the observatory lacked the funding to keep him on staff in his original capacity and thus offered to hire him as a janitor. Seriously. He declined their offer and quickly faded into obscurity, lacking the personal skills necessary for self-promotion both as an author and an accomplished astronomer who could have possibly been successful as a public speaker and promoter of astronomy. Robert Burnham Jr. died alone and destitute at the age of 61 in 1993. And this story has to be told to anyone who says that this kind of science and this kind of work doesn't matter, should be ashamed of themselves. It emerged later that he often attended meetings of the San Diego Astronomy Association at the Reuben H. Fleet Space Center in Balboa Park, San Diego. Sadly, for all his work and contributions to the field as an astronomer, and I'm sure many of those in attendance at those meetings used his work, none of the same in attendance at these meetings actually recognized him. During the time leading up to his death in 1993, he was selling paintings of cats at San Diego's Balboa Park. Quoting in part from Tony Ortega's 1997 article, quote, and this is so sad. So when I heard and I saw Dylan's video, I immediately thought of this, right? Quote, the old man who sold paintings of cats in Balboa Park entered San Diego's Mercy Hospital on March 9th, 1993. He was dying of congestive heart failure, the result of a heart attack he had suffered weeks earlier. Although he was only 61, his years in the park had prematurely aged him. He wore a beard, and his skin was tanned by his exposure to the sun, and he was very thin. He suffered several ailments, a blood clot in his heart, gangrene in one foot, pneumonia in his lungs. For days he lingered, but doctors decided not to take the risk of operating on him. At 6.03 p.m. on March 20th, the man's heart stopped beating. Days later, his body was sent to a military cemetery for cremation after a check on his social security number revealed that he had served in the U.S. Air Force. A marble headstone bearing his name was placed on a wall among the names of other cremated veterans at Point Loma's Fort Rosicrans National Cemetery in California. And sadly, and this just adds insult to injury, no one noticed that the name on the headstone was misspelled, the result of a clerical error on the man's death certificate. No one at the hospital or at the cemetery knew him, and no family members attended placement. He was just another weather-beaten, penniless man who saw paintings of cats in Balboa Park who had grown old and died. Continuing, years before he was a destitute painter, Robert Burnham Jr. had inscribed the universe. He was writer, astronomer, finder of comets and asteroids, and collector of ancient artifacts. Burnham was a singular Arizonan. He was a scientist whose work at Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff helped advance the understanding of the sun's neighborhood in space. He was an author whose name has become so familiar to some readers, it has become sort of a shorthand as we said before, like Audubon to Burtis, Hoyle to card readers, Webster for people who can't spell, and Robert to parliamentarians. More than 30 years after his publication, Burnham's Celestial Handbook, an observer's guide to the universe beyond the solar system, remains a sort of real life hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy, a compendium with something to say about nearly every cosmic destination worth visiting. Part travel guide, part history text, part encyclopedia. 
It's like a handheld natural history museum of the universe. And for decades, it's held a grip on the imagination of most people who, play, who ply the night skies with their telescopes, most of them looking through them, Dylan. People who yearn to travel in space and know that they can, that they can any dark and clear night. <clears throat> reading Burnham's massive three-volume work is like reading the notes of an adventurer who has spent a lifetime studying the treasures of a lost civilization. As a side note, how would we know about lost civilizations? They didn't have digital technology back then. How do we know about them, Dylan? Because they wrote it down in books. The only thing that's going to survive if, our if the tech we use today is gone in 100 years or in 500 years, or if we don't blow ourselves back to the Stone Age, then how will future historians and scholars actually come to know who the heck we are if we don't write it down, really physically write it down? Burnham's works, 2,138 pages, are loaded with tables of data, technical passages, and illustrations interspersed with historical arcania and ancient poetry, something put in there by someone who had an authentic love for his, for his um, chosen field. And all of it's meant as an incentive for the reader to recover those lost treasures by merely looking upward not into the back end of a camera. It's really compared to other books because there simply is no other like it. No other popular work approaches its utility and completeness. Few other scientific texts contain its sense of wonder and even spirituality. The three volume set is still in print, and if I could ever recommend a single work as a guide and an inspiration, it would be Burnham's. And to Dylan's last point, that we should all give up observational astronomy and go broke buying the latest camera or techno gadget that produces nothing but a few more petabytes of eye candy without any real learning taking place. The number one most useless piece of astronomy equipment I can think of is an eyepiece or your eyes, basically visual astronomy. Uh, really, if you're still using eyepieces, that's good. It's fun to show the family. It's fun to show your neighbors. Uh, but you really need to grow up and do some proper astronomy. Get yourself a digital camera and get into this fascinating hobby. You are letting yourself, your telescope and your parents down by not getting into astrophotography. <laughs> by anything I've said, please leave your vitriolic comments below, uh, hit the dislike button and make sure you unsubscribe because really subscription doesn't matter on YouTube anymore. All that matters is that you actually interacted with the video and then YouTube will just keep hitting you up to watch more. My apathy is extremely inclusive and remember everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Yeah. Sorry to push your bubble Dylan, but not everyone has large corporate sponsors to subsidize their quest to acquire more toys. Astronomy is a science, and observing the sky has, well, let's take another look at our soon-to-be-released book, another quote. While much has changed over the intervening decades since Burnham, much has remained the same, although the how of learning the sky hasn't changed really. The vehicle, the medium, through which we learn the sky has changed. The how is the comparison of the real sky as observed above, with a map of the sky that includes the constellations with their, with their respective stars, color types, non-stellar objects, etc. Okay. The center-folded maps in each monthly edition of Sky and Telescope, which Dylan mentioned, and which I look at too every month, and other various guides are the vehicles. They're the physical printed media that you can hold up, mark, make notes on, etc. This activity of comparing a printed medium often held over your head with the actual sky helps, de helps development of the individual's spatial acuity and thus helps, helps them learn the sky. You have to answer a question. This is a, a binary choice. Do you want to learn the sky, learn the science of astronomy, or you just want to take pretty pictures? They're not mutually exclusive, but they're not the same thing. 
Yes, there are many applications widely available for use on a broad range of electronic devices, and I use many of them. But learning the sky, the process where you train your brain, your spatial memory, where you remember, where you remember patterns, associate stars and constellations, and their respective and the respective seasons, remember star names and associate them with their respective colors and brightnesses, developing skills and as one who can navigate the sky without the use of Stellarium or the latest app on your phone are best learned not with an electronic device, but with the real charts where you can make notes, draw, interact with them, physically interact with them, hold them over your head, and comparing the chart to the sky above. You can't do that with Stellarium or a computer. Okay, You have to ask yourself, what informs the technology that you're using in your hand as a mobile phone, as a mobile device, or a computer? What information is informing that? What information was built, was consulted to actually input to those devices? Those devices are just readouts of exi existing data and information. That information was gleaned by physical observation, by a human being, by a real person, recording data. Okay, a lot of this data goes back way before the, the, the advent of the internet. Okay? Oh, and as a last point, what happens, and I mentioned this earlier, and I, it, it bears repeating, what happens in, say, 50, 100, 500, or even 1,000 years when much or all of the tech we use today, right now, is either obsolete, gone, or maybe we will have just blown ourselves back to the Stone Age. How will historians and scholars then say in a thousand years, reconstruct what we accomplished if we don't actually write it down and produce a real physical record of what we did? Right? This is how we've come to learn about civilizations and cultures that have lived, thrived, and died thousands of years ago by finding real, tangible physical records, books, and charts and by learning from them and preserving them in living memory. As we begin this segment, it should be pointed out that the true structure of spiral galaxies was observed visually in 1845 by William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, using his 1.8 meter, 72 inch speculum mirror telescope in Parsons, Parsons Town, County Westmeath, Ireland. These objects were often referred to as nebulae or spiral nebulae in the 19th century. These terms were used to describe non-stellar objects before their true nature had been determined. Observing and subsequently rendering it in a drawing, the spiral structure of Messier 51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, is clearly depicted as are some of the more luminous O and B class stars in the galaxy's spiral arms. It should be emphasized that this was done visually at the dawn of the photographic era. As regards discarding your eyepieces and spending a small fortune on the latest camera, really? I still have my very first set of eyepieces, Dylan, and wouldn't trade them for, for the best digital camera in the world. Why? Because what I see through the telescope visually, like the spatial learning process described above, the visual observation of the object of interest completes the learning process. You physically see a telescopically enhanced image of what your eye sees faintly and from a distance. The mystery, the wonder of astronomy is realized visually even with a modest telescope. Before I was age 20, I produced more than one diffraction limited set of Newtonian optics and still have those telescopes today. What's more special with observing all the great objects of interest visually as described above is doing so with a set of optics made by your own hands, the memory and the mystery of that object. The learning and the experience never fades, where one aspect informs and enhances the other. And Albert Einstein said quite famously, imagination is more important than knowledge. And if you take a picture of it, Dylan, there's no more imagination. When you look at it, there's still that mystery, that wonder that keeps you coming back for more. Okay. And this is some, some, some anecdotal notes of mine, I think, kind of 
speaks to where I'm coming from. When I was a young child, long before I received my first telescope as a Christmas gift from my parents, I often looked up at the moon and thought to myself, that is what the moon will look like in a hundred years from now, a thousand, from you, a thousand years from now, and long after I'm gone. While looking up at the full moon the other day, I finally recalled those thoughts of so long ago and thought to myself, here I am, the same person as if transported through time, the living embodiment of those thoughts. This reflection gave me an inner peace and solace in a world that is most uncertain as of now, confirming for me that I am still that same young man I was on that night, so many orbits around the sun later. I remember how great life was back then and how simple it was. As a child, I also remember the beautiful dark sky of rural downstate New York in the early 1960s. The Milky Way and the Galactic Center took your breath away. In fact, it was so bright, it cast a shadow and you could almost read by it. Those vistas have been gone for decades now, and along with them, the inspiration that energized the nation to reach for the moon and the stars, and so we did. That same inspiration is realized by visually looking through a telescope, not by taking a picture of an object, as if you were in a clinic going for an exam, taking an x-ray, or something like that. Looking at the, scar the stars and the beauty of the night sky inspired hum humankind since recorded history, and that's now gone. And with Starlink, now able to circle the whole planet, even through a telescope, the visual observation that you could make will now be forever marred and compromised with artificial satellites, even with the new telescopes coming online soon, like the Vera C. Rubin Telescope, and the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope and the Extremely Large Telescope. All these next generation telescopes will be now compromised. Looking at the stars and the beauty of the night sky inspired humankind since recorded history, and that's now gone. That combined with the ability to spread bad ideas at the speed of light, it's no wonder now we have the emergence of really new fringe beliefs and I have produced a recent video about one, and the exponential rise in superstition and violent extremism, concurrent with an almost complete breakdown of society. One only has to look at the daily news to see how far we've gone. Why? Because nature abhors a vacuum of any kind. And what we have today is an intellectual and moral vacuum born of a lack of inspiration. So I disagree, Dylan. We need to take those eye pieces out, dust them off, and make sure they never get they, they never get put away. Space exploration, reaching for the stars, rockets, planets with rings, moon craters, galaxies, exploding stars, were all cool back in the day. They were inspiring, and this stuff kids dreamed about. Astronauts were almost mythical hero heroes. Astronauts were to were then and remain today heroes. Where did all that go? We don't look outward or upward anymore, literally or metaphorically. We have become selfish, cynical, and inward looking. Those great Apollo missions of the sixties and seventies were made possible by individuals who more, whose moral fiber and character were cast in the mold of service, born of courage and the desire for authentic human progress and exploration. Those sentiments, those ideas are now largely gone. The legacy of those individuals and their missions live on in the astronaut corps of today and was exemplified in the servicing mission for the final Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, STS-125 in 2009, aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis. Former NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe canceled SM-4 following the Challenger disaster, I remember it well, citing too many uncertainties for a mission that wasn't of critical national importance. The Hubble Space Telescope is an iconic representation of discovery and exploration for a good reason. What Administrator O'Keefe failed to recognize is that it doesn't matter what the mission is. 
whether it's servicing and orbiting unmanned observatory or a resupply mission to a, a fledging lunar outpost. It represents us, humankind, in our tireless quest for discovery and exploration. That telescope has pushed back the frontiers of our knowledge and understanding and the literal horizon of what we can see. Spaceflight is an enterprise fraught with dangers and risks, and the brave astronauts accept those risks when they sign up for the job. And that's the one thing Administrator O'Keefe failed to recognize. Following his resignation, new NASA Administrator Michael Griffin rallied the troops and managed to put SM-4 back on the space shuttle's docket. The mission was a brilliant success and extended the life of Hubble at, by at least a decade, and it's been over a decade now, and it's going to continue well into this next decade. To say nothing of the enhancements and upgrades, but those, but those astronauts are a diminishing breed. Neil Armstrong, the commander of Apollo 11, and the first man to set foot on another world, our moon, passed away in 2012 at the age of 82. The remaining two astronauts, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, are both in their 80s. Who is going to take their place? Not people who spend their nights looking at, um, at raw image files or looking at the back of a camera, but looking through the eyepiece of a telescope. That's who, Dylan. Since the, end of, since the end of mission for the space shuttle program, we don't even have a national low Earth orbit booster, but yet we, succeeded, we successfully completed six manned missions to the moon over 40 years ago. We now have to rely on private enterprise and foreign governments to fulfill our commitments to the International Space Station. Why wasn't this a national priority when everyone knew the end date for the space shuttle program? It's a good question, right? Mm. Isaac Newton died in 1727. Albert, Albert Einstein died the year I was born, and Stephen Hawking has passed away, and nature wasn't very kind to him. Yes, we have some very smart people around, but we're simply not producing any more Einsteins or Hawkings, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yet, I'm still hopeful that in the end, the light of reason will be victorious, and the vision of, of an inspired world, united together, looking upwards and outwards towards the stars. Our future and our destiny is exemplified by this young child chasing the Juno spacecraft along a Florida beach as it ascends into the sky. The light of reason will win out and we will prevail. In what could only be described as a visual metaphor of a bright, hopeful, limitless future, this image, iconic as it is inspirational, epitomizes what is the best in us, the potential we have to soar to new heights. A young child chasing Juno along a Florida beach as the intrepid explorer he slips the surly bonds of Earth into a brilliant blue, limitless sky. It's important to remember that we are evolving on two parallel tracks, and which one we choose will ultimately decide our legacy, who we are, and where we will be. Let us all choose the right path. And Albert Einstein said quite famously, imagination is more important than knowledge. And if you take a picture of it, Dylan, there's no more imagination. When you look at it, there's still that mystery, that wonder that keeps you coming back for more. Okay? The great philosopher Plato famously said, astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to another. Astronomy for Change is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to affect positive change through astronomy and science education. It is our belief that by inspiring and empowering current and future generations to become interested and engaged in astronomy and science, this positive change will be realized. If you found this video helpful and educational, please like, subscribe, and share. Also, why not consider supporting us on Patreon? Head over to our homepage, astronomyforchange.org, click support us via PayPal or Patreon, and choose a membership level suitable for you. Every little bit helps, support, helps us produce the great content and further our mission. Also, why not consider becoming a member? Membership is free at Astronomy for Change. Choose the membership 
membership link here. Click it. Put your name and your first name or and your email, and you'll be added to our list. You'll receive a comprehensive digest of all our videos and articles and all our great content. Joining and becoming a patron helps us grow and improve and more fully realize our mission. Thank you. This is Dr. Jim Daly for Astronomy for Change. Until the next video, please stay well and keep looking up.